like to welcome you all and thanks for joining us in what I hope will be uh, an engaging and exciting discussion today uh, about some of the means by which diversity uh, can be ensured as part of the ongoing revision uh, and evolution of broadcasting in Canada and media in general. Uh, my name is Mark Hayward. Uh, I'm an associate professor in the Department of Communication uh, Studies at York University. I'm also a member of the graduate program of uh, Communication and Culture, uh, which is a joint program between York and Ryerson. Um, uh, again, thank you for joining us. I'd like to begin uh, with a land acknowledgement, which speaks to the location of the campuses of York University. York University recognizes that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. The area known as Takaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation, and this territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. As we begin our conversation today, I think it's though important for us to pause and reflect on what the process of the land acknowledgement is intended to accomplish. And it's meant to be more than just a recitation at the beginning of meetings and gatherings. Uh, it's, it's an attempt, I think, to bring to the forefront, forefront of every gathering here at the university, but also more broadly, uh, the historical and culture, contemporary imbrication of institutions like York University and the Canadian government in processes of settler colonialism. Uh, and it's a practice that I think is particularly important given what we are here today to discuss, which is about ensuring that media policy on the territory of the nation of Canada uh, is one that is capable of embracing a wide number of voices and in particularly those of indigenous persons and indigenous communities. Um, and I there are a few other comments that I'd like to make to sort of set the stage for this. Uh, and I recognize that time is always very limited, um, but I wanna talk about a few things that sort of might help us to frame some of the things that I'm hoping that we can talk about. Now, much of my recent work has been focused on the history of media serving minority groups and marginalized communities in the Canadian context. And in my recent book, I talk about how we might think about the history of multicultural of media in a multicultural society as a question of infrastructure. And we tend to think about roads, we tend to think about the power grid when we talk about infrastructure, we tend to think about bridges and rivers but we may not necessarily always think about media and communication and the central role that they play, that they play a similar role as infrastructure. And it's essential to ensuring how we live together in large complex social space. And I think that this broadly uh, occasion and this discussion broadly occasioned by the ongoing process of revising the Canadian Broadcasting Act can be approached in a similar manner. The discussions we have may focus on aspects of particular aspects of the process. Uh, some of this may be the, few, the, pro, the focus of future discussions, but the act itself, I think, plays a role very much akin to that of infrastructure. It's like the operating system of our media. Of our media. It sets terms and definitions, uh, and perhaps most importantly, it can determine who is and who isn't part of that system. And along with this, how rules can be developed and enforced. And so it's within this that I think it's an important way for us to begin to realize really what's at stake. Uh, it's not a small question. It is kind of the question of how we think about media in our society. And the second point, I think, and this is directly related to what's in discussion about uh, what's at stake in a discussion about Bill C-10 and what will follow from Bill C-10, is one that I'd like to draw on the history of media and diversity uh, in Canada over the last 60 to 70 years uh, and beyond that. And it's important to recognize that diversity, at least in terms of the kinds of diversity that will make for a vibrant uh, society and culture, has not, and this is the risk, may not in future be something that is easily granted or given. Uh, the history of media and multiculturalism is a reminder that the space for diverse voices, uh, whether this is in terms of languages or cultures, access to technology and so on, how media relates to audiences, is one that has often had to be fought for from the outside of centers of power. One might look back to the history of say, the establishment of the first multilingual radio stations in the 1950s and 60s, where these weren't things that were easily available. One might look at actually the emergence of a service like APTN 
in which the advocacy was given very much from people who were excluded from the hearings, who forced their way into the conversation in order to guarantee a spot on the dial and now in the broader cultural space. And so I think what's at stake here is not simply to say, we can wait and assume that these things will come if we just are patient, but it's important always to ensure that this is at the center of conversations because it's too easy to forget about how these may not be at the center of the mainstream concerns. So, and in this way, I mean, basically what I'm saying is when we talk about Bill C-10, when we talk about broadcasting, we aren't just talking about whether or not Netflix will do this or that. We're talking about a really fundamental question about democracy, about people, about the complex cultures and peoples that live on this territory and how we can make a future for that. Um, so that's where I'm coming from in terms of why I pulled this together. But I'm not here to talk. It's not a lecture, it's not a classroom. Uh, and I'm so going to turn this over very soon uh, to our uh, very, very wonderful participants. Uh, I'm going to introduce each of you in turn, uh, and then we'll sort of get to the conversation. Um, our first, uh, I want to, and this is by alphabetical order, um, as I thought of as I was calling this, Aldo always came up first because Aldo is both an A and a D. So Aldo uh, is, uh, was born in Argentina and has been a lifelong resident of Toronto since his family immigrated to Canada in the 1960s. Uh, he graduated from the U of T Faculty of Law. Uh, he served as a corporate commercial lawyer at a leading Canadian law firm, Blake Castles and Graydon. And in 1993, he joined the leading Canadian TV producer distributor, Sullivan Entertainment. In 1998, he joined T Tele Latino Network. And as TLN president over the past 23 years, Otto has led an expansion strategy that has launched new digital TV channels in Italian, Spanish, and English, improved content production, and established new domestic and international programming relationships at Tele Latino. Most recently in 2019, Aldo and three longstanding uh, community shareholders bought back the 50.5% 50 point, 50 point, 50 interest in TLN that was previously held by Chorus Entertainment, and thus the group was renamed TLN Media Group and has become a fully independent, ethnic-owned and focused company. Our next participant is uh, Monica Il, who is a member of the uh, of Abnaki First Nation of Odenak. She has built a rich and diverse portfolio over the course of nearly 30 years in the broadcasting industry. As I read these bios, I realized I am humbled by like the centuries of expertise that will be speaking to us today, um, cumulatively, not individually, just to be <laughs> clear. <laughs> um, uh, so after graduating with distinction from the Université de Québec à Montréal, she entered the industry by working at the Soci Société Radio-Canada and then for the National Film Board. And during her time at the NFB, she was instrumental in the development of new training program for Indigenous filmmakers. From this experience, it introduced her to the world of film production, eventually inspiring her, her to film her first documentary, French Man, Native Son. She's also worked with Quebec Native women in Montreal and the Assembly of First Nations in Ottawa. Uh, she brought her vision to APTM in 2003 uh, when she joined as a member of the, as the Quebec Liaison Officer. And most recently, she served as the Executive Director of Programming and Scheduling. Her accomplishments at the network led her to the appointment as Chief Executive Officer of APTM in 2019. And she currently sits on the boards of the Youth Media Alliance, Media Smarts, uh, Linis, and Teatro Espasco, and sits on the NFB Indigenous Advisory Board, uh, Quebec Regional Panel. And in 2019, she was named one of the Maison Saint Gabriel's exceptional women. Uh, so thank you for joining us, Monica. Our next participant is Randy Reed, uh, who is an experienced broadcaster uh, and expert in experiential engagement. He is a producer, he is a veteran producer uh, uh, of primetime uh, radio programming on the Toronto Airwaves, Airwaves over the past 10 years. And he's delivered some of the most popular morning shows and captivating interviews with Canadian and international musical icons. He's readily recognized as one of the country's most engaging radio personalities as identified by his three-time National Stylist Spin Fest Awards uh, in 2010, 2011, and 2012. Um, 
<clears throat> Reed also has successfully demonstrated his prowess and passion for traditional journalism, launching a national and provincial award-winning youth media news initiative in conjunction with Torstar Media and the Boys and Girls Club across Canada. Currently, he has been leading an important shift at VX3 Exchange. He was instrumental in launching a popularly branded ethnic radio station, 5105, which is based on the campuses of York University, and is directing the evolution of a vibrant social purpose enterprise that creates connective experiences and creates art solutions through cooperative model models of engagement and volunteerism. He is also the current president of the National Community Radio Association. Madeline Zemiak is a senior broadcast executive and diversity champion. She is recognized for influencing both public and private sector uh, as, multilingual, as a multilingual media advocate, a renowned and sought after expert in diversity, inclusion, and integration, and in the media profession as well. As a celebrated broadcaster, internationally recognized as an industry pioneer, Madeline Zemiak has been involved in ethnic media for over 30 years and was most recently the National Vice President of Rogers Omni Television. She's also Chair of the Canadian Ethnic Media Association. And for her dedication over the course of her career, she's received the Order of Canada, the Order of Ontario, the Queen Elizabeth II Golden and Diamond Jubilee Medals, as well as numerous community, government, and industry-related honors. She's a former Chair for the Ontario Region, region of the Canadian Broadcast Standards Council, a former vice chair of women in film and television in Toronto, and a founding member of the Strategic Alliance for Broadcasters for Aboriginal Reflection and a co-chair of the International Press Freedom Awards. Um, she was a former co-chair of the Task Force on Cultural Diversity on Television and chair of the jury of the Awards of Excellence and Canadian at, run by the Canadian Race Relations Foundation. I'd like to thank all four of uh, our participants today for taking time from their busy schedules to speak with us. Uh, and from there, um, uh, hopefully enough of me and we'll move on to the conversation. As I sort of shared with them before we started, the framework here isn't really a debate. I don't know if there are sides uh, that are different here so much as perspectives on a single question. And there may be differences, but we'll start not so much from the pro and con model of the traditional sort of debate, sort of into the conversation of a conversation and a discussion to bring ideas to the table and to think about what we can talk about more broadly. And the place I kind of wanted to start is what I think is one of the most promising, uh, but also possibly one of the most uh, fraught and risky aspects of Bill C-10 as it's currently phrased. Building on some of the language that entered into the Broadcasting Act in 1991, which recognized that Canada is a multicultural and multilingual nation, uh, the current text of C-10 is even more explicit when stating that the aims of the Act should be to support, and here I'm quoting, uh, the needs and interests of all Canadians, including Canadians from racialized communities and Canadians of diverse ethnocultural backgrounds, socioeconomic statuses, abilities and disabilities, sexual orientations, gender identities and expressions and ages, reflect and reflect their circumstances and aspirations, including equal rights, the linguistic duality and multicultural and multiracial nature of Canadian society, as well as the special place of Indigenous peoples within that society. Elsewhere in the, bill, in, the, in the bill's language, it mentions that all undertakings should give space to viewpoints from Indigenous and racialized communities, as well as diverse ethnic, ethnocultural backgrounds. And so my question sort of starts here, which is to say, in light of this generalization of the responsibility to provide access to the range of viewpoints, what is the role? in the present moment for Indigenous and ethnocultural media to play. If the barriers to access in terms of how content can be produced and distributed uh, may be lowered with access to digital media, what and how do we think about a role for these services in the contemporary context? What has changed, but also perhaps what has not changed? In other words, if one of the priorities of the media system in future is for every undertaking, every broadcaster and digital service to represent diverse voices, what role is there for those broadcasters and those media outlets that have historically played this role to play in this new context that's being established? 
Now, I'm not sure who would like to sort of start with that conversation. Um, I may just mention somebody's name. I'm going to, maybe I'll give Aldo a break because I've been mentioning him no, first. No, no, I, I, I don't worry. I can jump in if you, okay. want me to if you want me to break the ice and set the tone. Um, and thank you very much because uh, it's important that during this time of pandemic and a lot of other uh, issues that are really important in society, that you um, provide the context for why this is important. This is not just industry players uh, jockeying for position, at least as far as I think many of the people around this, uh, this virtual table are concerned. Um, I think you're right about social infrastructure. I think you're right that this is important. Um, it comes at a difficult time, but it has been since 1991 that the Broadcasting Act has not been modernized. And now that we're um, saying it will be modernized, it's important that we do that properly. Um, um, it, the context here is that the Yale report was silent on the Yale report, which is the independent study of uh, the Broadcasting and Telecommunications Regulations in Canada, also known as the Yale Report after the, um, um, uh, the chair, Janet Yale, uh, was silent on ethnic diversity, was silent on linguistic diversity, was silent on multiculturalism, 235 pages, 97 recommendations, and there was no discussion of these issues. That's significant. A lot of people have let that pass, but that is the report upon which this legislation was uh, tabled uh, and founded. So it's important that in that context, we make sure that there's, this is not a matter of lip service, that we make real progress and advancement on what the government itself and others during this time have identified as systemic inequities. Um, and so, um, I think it's important that uh, that we um, fully include, not fully exclude, ethnic minority voices and stories, um, but also independent broadcasters generally. Both uh, Monica's organization and ours are members of the Independent Broadcasters Group, uh, a group of uh, a representative group of a dozen independent broadcasters, both ethnic and non-ethnic. Um, uh, Anglo and Franco, uh, Indigenous and non-Indigenous. Uh, this group of broadcasters represents uh, a community of minority broadcasters in Canada that have been squeezed since 1991 into a market share of 10%. So 90% of the market is controlled in broadcasting in Canada, uh, which purports to have a diversity of voices. So the magic word is diversity. Um, which unfortunately has been warped in terms of its, uh, its meaning and its application by the CRTC, we represent only 10% of the broadcast market in Canada. So we've already been squeezed into the margins. The fear is that Bill C-10 as written could potentially squeeze us right out of business. Um, Okay, I could monopolize the next hour, but yep. let me yeah. let the next person I, I, talk. I saw, I, saw you, I saw Monica nodding, so I think maybe yeah. I'll, uh, yeah, yeah. Ask if she wants to add something. Yeah, no, thank you very much, Aldo. And, and further th to that, uh, one of your question mark was, you know, the role of our, if we could be considered ourselves a specialty, is that media broadcasters in Canada should reflect all Canadians, all diversity. However, the difference with um, indigenous media per se or ethnic media is that we're an expression of who we are. So that's the difference in the landscape is how we bring these stories to life, the different perspectives we bring to the landscape. So hopefully now we are now listened to because we choose the stories we want to share. We control our, our image, we control our, our, our voices. So we decide what stories you want to bring up from not only the sensational stories, but the stories of success as well. So hopefully we're listened to rather than talked about. So that's where there's a big difference between mainstream media that do cover um, diversity uh, and stories and, and let's say for APTN to cover those stories. So I think we complement one another and I don't think one could exist without the other because then you would not have a true picture of the Canadian society. 
So I truly believe that even though we have a very small market share, uh, we play an important role in servicing our peoples. When I mean our peoples, I mean the different nations of Canada. And I think that is, we're so often underestimated in everything that we bring to the landscape. And hopefully with Bill C-10, if I just could go uh, concerning Indigenous people, we do see an AP-10 truly supports now that there is a appreciation and a recognition of Indigenous owned media and Indigenous languages. And for us, it was very important to see that when they talk about broadcasting French and English, to also have Indigenous languages up there. That recognition show the everything that the Indigenous peoples bring to this country. I mean, we've been here for times of memorial, uh, way before everybody and everything that we, we, we sacrifice and was taken away from us. At least now we have this recognition, recognition and they know the important role that we bring to the landscape. If I could add also, I think it, it's so important. This is the 21st century. And many of us who've been um, you know, slogging away and trying to get recognition for the marginalized, marginalized communities expressions in Canada, both in indigenous, multilingual, multicultural communities, and you know, we're backed by organizations such as the Canadian Ethnocultural Council, where I know the president, Don Campioni, is, is online. It's so important to, it, we're, we've, been in, we've been frozen. And it, just the fact that there has not been an ethnic policy review for, for decades, um, can, the Canadian content ruling is also very outdated. And still, I mean, reminiscing of the 1950s and 1960s, not to be too harsh, we're looking at old stock Canadian expression. And I think there has to be systemic and regulatory uh, intense reform in order to really you know, be able to harness the, the stories that are out there. And you know, specifically, and we speak with Aldo about this all the time, every fifth person in Canada speaks another language other than English and French, English or French or indigenous languages. And it is time not only to um, give kudos and, and you know, sort of you know, applaud, applaud the fact that we're a diverse country, but really you know, speak and harness and get the action to those words. And I, I'm sadly, the, the, the Broadcast Act um, is a great opportunity to be inclusive and sadly, you know, the verbiage and the, the wording is not there strongly enough to really mine and develop and evolve the, the very enthusiastic independent producers who are here um, as a labor of love and also as a profession and craft trying to capture uh, the, real, the real stories in Canadian history, uh, positive reflection of the communities, the success stories, and as mainstream media uh, traditional media continues to be marginalized. There's huge opportunities for uh, vehicles of expression and really getting the au courant, the, the correct reflection of the, these communities' issues and their realities. And it's hard to you know, penetrate a structure and a system that has been sadly somewhat hostile to these voices and, and this, this kind of expression that has to happen, especially now during these times uh, we've seen um, during COVID where multilingual communities were not given the support to express, were not given the information uh, you know, to express and to, and to help support their audiences and communities. So it's time to shake up the infrastructure of the regulatory arena. Yeah, I, I think some interesting things have already been said, so I won't belabor a lot of the points that have been made, but um, when we do look at the, the Bill C-10 Act right now, as it states, um, I think Mark used the interesting uh, analogy of an operating system. And I think when you, when you, when language is omitted from at the very beginning of, a, of the starting bot, it's really difficult to onboard new concepts and ideas to um, positions that are outside of the mainstream. And I think when we're talking about um, ethnocultural and indigenous communities, it's not just a matter of access from my standpoint, but more so assuring an equitable balance 
of content reflecting of the demographic landscape that makes up Canada right now. So I guess uh, in specific specificity to Mark's point, I think broadcasters should be, and it's been said already, that there needs to be a holistic reform or restructuring of how operations are um, conducted across Canada and how we nurture talent from diverse communities to reflect, uh, to produce content that's reflective of the markets um, that are re re really coast to coast across Canada right now. And I think it's also, and it's also important. Madeline then Alder, sorry. Okay, it's also important, I think, you know, to take this situation seriously. Um, too often in, in the previous decades, it, it's, it's sort of been a, a nice to have, but not necessary. This is essential really for democracy in Canada. This is important to be able to reflect the issues that communities have and to have honest conversations and to have the space to you know, have that happen. So it's, uh, it's been a long time of struggles for many in different organizations. And it's, it's when we take a look at everything from Black Lives Matters to BIPOC, the time really is now to open up the highways you know, for this kind of Canadian storytelling and not just play, you know, tribute to it and not just speak about diversity and niceties. As Madeline said, 20% of Canadians, according to the last census, seven and a half million people more or less say they regularly or most often speak a language other than our official languages at home. That is a significant proportion of the population uh, they need to be serviced in their language with stories that emanate from Canada about themselves, from themselves, by those communities, for those communities, and for Canadians at large, because um, uh, it's important, as uh, Madeline said, that there's be some cross-cultural understanding. Um, so first of all, it's a significant population. It's deserving of recognition. The Charter of Rights and Freedoms, sections 15 and 27, just to remind everybody, talk about equal protection and equal benefit under the law. And section 27 um, points to the preservation and enhancement of the multicultural heritage of Canadians, that all the rights there under are to be interpreted to preserve and enhance the multicultural heritage of Canadians. That um, is not happening. Uh, as, as Randy has pointed out, um, we've divorced linguistic diversity from diversity, very conveniently, as if culture doesn't have anything to do with language, whereas language is the primary marker of different ethnocultural communities. Um, so, you know, one of the particular specific amendments to this legislation that we've been tabling with the support of Madeline and the Canadian Ethnic Media Association, with the support of Dominic Campione uh, and the Canadian Ethnocultural Council, uh, with the support of uh, our colleagues in ethnic broadcasting, um, the uh, Ethnic Channels Group, uh, and the, with the support of others as well is, uh, the inclusion of multilingualism in the objectives to the Broadcasting Act. Um, it's called for, um, it's necessary societally uh, to service that 20% community. It's necessary because of the charter. It's necessary because of the, uh, the very mandate letter that was delivered by the government to the heritage minister, the current heritage minister, specifically states that in working to modernize the Broadcasting Act, uh, the legislation should also consider additional cultural and ling linguistic communities. I, well, I, that I, generalized I, language that you read, Mark, um, is the weakest form of recognition and support and specifically does not include linguistic diversity. So um, all we're asking for in the amendments we're asking to be made by um, the Heritage Committee, uh, who are responsible now and are reviewing the legislation and have already heard from different players, including establishment players most recently, is that uh, there be parity for ethnic minorities and ethnocultural media. 
And what parity means is that the objectives of the broadcasting system should ensure that there's a place for programming that is reflective of those communities, programming that speaks the languages of those communities, and programming services that are owned and operated by ethnocultural community members. And I see Monica nodding yeah. because I am basically uh, mirroring the protections which quite rightly are included in the draft legislation for Indigenous communities. And you know, Aldo, I totally agree with that because especially when you talk about the language at the beginning, the languages, they hold your stories, they hold your 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 your, your dances, your songs. There's the foundation of your culture. When you lose your language, you lose a part of your identity. And this is something very close to Indigenous peoples. I mean, there's many, many languages in Canada on the verge of extinction. The Abenaki language, uh, language of my my mom. I mean, my mom speaks it, and but you know, unfortunately, I know a few words here and there. But this is this is we're losing it, and a big part of our culture is 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 just dying. So you know, recognition of language. Some people don't understand fully the the impact of a language, and, You're and right. this language, the beauty of a language. You know, we're talking about diversity. What is diversity exactly? It's the richness, richness of one's culture and how it brings insight, how it brings connection. Languages connect. People forget that, how important it is, the language. And, you know, I'm very, I mean, I, I totally, I support everything that you say. And we've worked really hard to have that, that recognition in the broadcast, like, especially in Bill C-10, the recognition of Indigenous languages and Indigenous-owned media. Well, that's another big one. I mean, people, like what I said at the beginning, they underestimate everything that indigenous owned media bring to the table. I mean, if it wasn't for APTN, I mean, a lot of indigenous creators would not exist today. We were fundamental in creating, nurturing and supporting a viring indigenous production community. I mean, would those yeah. stories have been told here and there? Yeah, maybe it would have been picked up here by one or two broadcaster, but not to the extent that APTN did. I mean, we've changed. I mean, we've changed the landscape. I mean, it, it, it's internationally, we're better known and appreciated for what we brought to the table than within, our, within Canada. And would it have made sense, would it have made sense for the CRTC to have entrusted Indigenous broadcasting to an establishment player, a non-Indigenous establishment player? No, it would not have made sense. Nobody would agree with that. But what did they do in the last two years, Mark? You know this very well. Madeline knows this very well. They entrusted multicultural broadcasting to non-multicultural organization, um, an organization not focused on the multicultural community. It's not multicultural programming made by multicultural Canadians for multicultural Canadians and owned by multicultural Canadians. It's, uh, it's a different model than has been followed on the Indigenous front. And our argument all along is there are four pillars to Canadian society. Uh, the Anglo-Franco founding cultures, the Indigenous uh, communities, and our multicultural communities. That's from the get-go yet they don't have the parity in this broadcasting legislation, nor have they, and we're just talking about the legislation. We're talking about the objectives of the act and then empowering the CRTC to actually be able to implement those objectives through rules and regulations and uh, initiatives. Uh, so far, the CRTC hasn't done a great job. Um, they've been misled to um, create a system where we're marginalized. Linguistic diversity is not, has been interpreted as, as long as ethnic communities in Canada have access to programming in their language from wherever in the world, then they're good, take that, yeah. right? From wherever in the good, from wherever in the world. We don't say that to the Anglo and Franco, uh, English and French language, Canadians. We don't say, as long as you get English and French programming from anywhere in the world, you're good. But that's what's been said, because 
the opening the gates to foreign services operating in Canada and the fact that now digitally everybody has access to everything internationally, the CRTC has interpreted that as, well, that's comprehensive coverage. You're hearing stories from around the world. Well, I don't think that Rush, RT, Russian television, CCTV, Chinese television, Al Jazeera, and every other international service from around the world has the economic, cultural, or political interests of Canadians at heart. And only Canadians can be making Canadian diverse programming. I know you're trying to cut me off. Go ahead. It's rough, it's rough to have a lawyer on the, on the committee. Oh, uh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I mean, part of what you're raising there, I think you're raising a whole series of issues that I think are really important, right? Whether we think about this, not just in terms of uh, national ownership, but in some ways, uh, community ownership or some connection back to community when we think about community, but also to think about this in terms of how we think about um, the local, the national in different ways. And I, you know, particularly, I'm, I kind of want to turn to Randy in this context where the, the geographic scale at which, um, say, the radio station operates is fundamentally different, but shares some of the, 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 the common ties from when one is thinking at a national scale. But how do we sort of think about this in terms of the kind of diversity that we're sort of seeing embedded into this language where I hear what you're saying. Is it is it about being representative of a percentage of the population as an aggregate? Is it about recognizing that that's actually a bad measure? Because really we're talking about that connection on the ground, right? Which may not be lived as a percentage, that's lived as a community. Uh, and right. if we're thinking about this as a being lived as a community who live in a place as opposed to uh, as, a, as a slice of a pie chart. And so how do we think about ensuring that diversity at all of its scales and all of its complexity is, is something that can find its way into the broadcast act? Well, I think, I think um, well, it's true. And I think the passion that's coming from the, the panel is really based on all of the omissions for the years past. It's hard to trust that the best interest of the diversity of the country is gonna be incorporated into the language or the ideology of the act because for so many years it, it's, it's been omitted. But like I can speak from uh, a local, regional, um, national scale from the standpoint, like I'm 40 years old and I represent one out of every two Canadians, one out of every two Canadians, 40 plus. I was born and raised in the country. I visited every province and territory. And I say this all to outline the fact that media content in Canada has never represented my experience. And I accepted that my lens wasn't representative of the majority at the time. And I realized the sector was, I thought at the time, making a calculated risk reward stance on distancing itself from demographics, um, from, the dem from my demographic at least. Um, but here we are 25 years later, I've been working in media through broadcast, uh, through print, um, and, all form and all forms of media. And uh, 25 years later, the conversation is still the same. And we're risking now not just disconnecting from half of the identified population of, uh, of the country, but also the next generation of content uh, consumers that are, that are coming across the country where we've, we throw these numbers around five, like, 8% or 10% of the population is, um, you know, uh, of, of different diversities and things of that nature. But that number is a lot larger. If we look at the um, Bill C-10 Act as a future proofing document, and we think about where we're going to be in 2031, or, or sorry, in, in 2031, and looking at the reality that half of the population is going to be from some form of diversity background, that a third of the population where he's going to speak a language other than English or French, um, those numbers become that much more skewed. So I guess to answer your question, one of the major structural shifts that I, I think I see us take, see taking place is the reimagining of the operational structures um, that make media right now, um, where we look at the um, mainstream presentation of media, I think that has to have a fundamental shakeup um, so that we can have a more equitable balance. Um, we can continue to do what we do. Um, I produce, Vibe 105 is the longest standing Afro-Caribbean leader, uh, leader in Afro-Caribbean content across the country. Nobody's produced more broadcast content for the Afro-Caribbean community than Vibe 105 over the past 30 years. APTN always, obviously does what it does, uh, TLN does what it does, and, and 
we still only reflectively represent 10% of the population. That's not a fair, that's not a fair equitable representation of how culture is consumed, presented, and um, distributed across the country. And I think that's uh, well, one area where we can um, sort of like hold uh, policymakers to the whole policy makers feet to the fire in terms of how that equitable um, infrastructure is laid out for opportunities for cultures, languages, and everything else. And, and to what, Randy's point, the fact that you're eight, 10, or even 2% doesn't make as much of a difference anymore because we have moved into an era of virtually unlimited bandwidth. Everything used to come at a cost if you gave one community a voice, it came at the expense of another community because there was limited bandwidth. Now, we can be more inclusive. Yes. We can, we can include all communities. Everyone can have their own voice. The it's bandwidth constraints are not, as not what they were in 1998 or 1991. It, it, so, but it, and it's on that note that I wanna sort of pull on one, I think one of the themes that comes across certainly the, the Yale report and the language around it, and that we sort of see reflected in the way that people are, um, uh, are supporting this particular uh, you know, revision of the Broadcasting Act, which is to say that this is actually an opening up, that this is not actually, this is something that will give space to, to, to more voices as opposed to fewer. And I think that this sort of builds on your point, and I think that this uh, that you just made, Aldo, but I think it asks for some qualification. So I remember early on in the process, I you know uh, that Lily Singh published a, an editorial, an op-ed that sort of sort of came forward and said, York alumni, Lily Singh. I feel the need to highlight that, but uh, but that early on in the process, she highlighted the process to say be attentive, do not put in place a framework that caps the wide range of voices that are already making their presence felt across digital media in a variety of ways from TikTok to YouTube, uh, you know, to the distribution of, of music by, you know, you know, SoundCloud or Bandcamp, how do we think about this? And I think one of the questions there is to say within that context, I mean, I'm hearing two things here is that broadcasters are key because they're the key, a key conduit for that process. But at the same time, how do we sort of develop or ensure that that relationship persists with what is a great potential for a much broader selection of, of, of media producers to enter into the conversation? And I think this is where we have to capture through the act and other legislation and policy, you know, these are all good intentions, but let's make them work. Let, let's turn this into meaningful policies, as well as funding. Right now, we know that multilingual uh, producers, and uh, I know there's many on, on this uh, virtual call, are shut out from, from, from the Canadian Media Fund. That would go to the key broadcaster, not to the individual producer. And this is where we have to nurture and evolve these future storytellers in Canada. Right. So, you know, I, I think that, you know, it's time to leave all these niceties and really turn this into a policy framework that is meaningful, that is equitable, that, you know, Charter of, you know, Rights and Freedoms, of course, states it. Let's, why does, why does the broadcasting environment shun this inclusion? We're all, we're simply looking at an equitable playing field. And certainly not only that, but let's turn this into a systemic funding mechanism that's equitable to, you know, the, commensurate population of Canada, be it multilingual, multicultural communities, um, indigenous communities. Let's, let's you know, take away this old stock Canadiana um, sort of pressure, if you will. So no, I-, I issue, Sorry. Go I'm, ahead, Aldo. No, no, on your issue of funding, uh, I think you're totally right. And it's, uh, but I would add another layer to it, which is, um, multilingual programming is, it's not a struggle between broadcasters and producers, it's a struggle between the collective of multilingual content makers and the system, because the system, uh, and in the case of uh, the Canadian Media Fund, a $350 million fund, $350 plus million fund, devotes all of 1% 
to the 20% of Canadians who operate in, who consume media in, uh, in uh, uh, non-official languages. 1% of the fund, it's chronically underfunded. Multi, this, that's lip service. When you symbolically create a fund that is meant to recognize the reality of multilingual and multicultural communities in Canada, and then fund it to the extent of 1% of your total funding, that's a problem. Um, and uh, anyway, I just wanted to add that to yeah. your uh, to your point sure. regarding the funding mechanisms, because sure. you mentioned Lily Singh, Mark, and it's important to distinguish between what Madeline and I are talking about, which is paid content um, in the form of channels, whether linear or ske linear schedule channels or on-demand channels, paid content versus free user-generated content. Mm -hmm. Nobody is trying to uh, supplant or reduce or restrict user-generated content. But user-generated content is essentially content producers who supply content for free to platforms. Lily Singh is a one in a million. And for every Lily Singh, there are a million people who are doing it as a hobby and certainly at the very most as a side hustle, but they certainly can't live on creating user-generated content. So nobody is trying to prevent people from doing that. But with respect to the system we built so far, imperfect as it may be, with only 10% of the system actually being in the hands of independents, that's the diversity that we have. 90% controlled by establishment angle flank or players, 10% independent. In the system we built, squeezing that 10% right out of existence is what this legislation as it stands would would set up um and that's i think what we're uh, resisting um i think that's how i reconcile your point about lily singh versus the changes that we're advocating uh including changes to funding because nobody funds the user generated content um and but producers who want to live producing content telling stories about their communities uh, are shut out. They're shut out because of a, a disproportionately um, inequitable um, share of the funding pie. Yeah, well, I think the bottom line is that we really do need reforms yeah. that really do support innovation and really do support uh, multilingual and language, you know, language-based producers. And that is that is not in existence. And I think, you know, we've been very lucky with the, the, the professionalism of many of these independent producers mm -hmm. and they, they need something to, you know, support their initiatives. That, and this is Canadian storytelling. We know very much uh, with many communities where the, the actual homeland, they're, they're getting the real history of the ethnocultural communities and indigenous communities here from Canadian producers. And that is being exported. Uh, you know, to countries around the world. And, you know, my community, the Belarusian community, for example, which is one of the last dictatorships in the world, actually got history that was corrected by authors, journalists, and producers here in Canada that was exported to a country that is one of the last countries that has a dictatorship, as we've heard Belarus in the news lately, you know, with the arrests of journalists, most lately female journalists. So this is the, these are actual jewels uh, here in Canada that not only is reflective of Canadian realities, but also contributing to countries around the world with their own histories from the, the professionals who are residing and are the storytellers in Canada. I think a practical solution uh, from that standpoint, when you talk about the, the Lily Singh factor, like I come from a world of independent and community led media and the, the success behind that is always through collaboration. So if you wanted to fix that media, if you wanted to fix that funding, funding mix or funding model, I think uh, the TLNs, the APT, a, APTNs of the world, um, the VX3s and um, NCRAs of the world provide hubs to support the development of those independent voices. So if you wanted to um, specifically look at that funding mix where um, Aldo identifies that 1%, that's only going to language. If some of that money went towards supporting those platforms that would, inf what would in, uh, 
inform the professional the professionalization of those independent broadcasters, those user generated uh, content producers, where if we're being honest, are some of the only spaces where you can get a lot of culture and language, dialect, and all of the things that come along with diversity. Um, it, has to, it has to start from there. If the mainstream interests don't support the development of those voices who have the capacity and maybe not yet the access or um, the, the ability to connect through higher level production, um, production systems, then the next best platform would be through already identified um, cultural spaces like the NCRAs, TLNs, APTNs of the world, et cetera, et cetera, and funding money through them to make the, the next Lily Singh a little bit more of a, a norm than a, uh, something, than, than a one-off. Or at least um, the the as Aldo said the the hundreds of thousands who are not at that level exactly to build yeah. a sustainable career as opposed to giving their all and then still being quashed out of out of the system. Um, Mark, do you want to add anything to this? Or? Well, yeah, no. I, um, you know, APTN was created because Indigenous media did not cover or reflect Indigenous perspectives. That's how APTN was created, right? right. So we did have the the, the support. Of, of the government for the creation of APTN. And like I mentioned, there was a handful of indigenous producers when we started. Now we really created a big network of indigenous creators and, and APTN strongly supports um, within its all its projects that training be given also to uh, emerging indigenous uh, in every project. Uh, so, I mean, when I listen to all of you, you have to say, I mean, um, I find that APTN is privileged in the sense that we are a mandatory carriage for the moment. We'll, we'll see, you know, <laughs> if that changes or not. But for the moment, we are a mandatory carriage. Our revenues are, are, are quite stable. Like everybody, you know, there's a drop in subscribers, but still we're able to continue to, to uh, fund projects and, and, and uh, continue to develop uh, new stories. Um, and, you know, we are aware of our situation and we really do the best we can to support the indigenous production community. And beyond that, we really try to create partnerships with other broadcasters to have a bigger reach for our stories. And we strongly um, invest in emerging talent. And that's something that's so important for us. I think we, we have this, this um, philosophy that always thinks of the generations to come is that we know how things are happening now, but we're trying to make sure that we have a place in, in seven years to come. Um, so always thinking, you know, this, and the um, Iroquois philosophy, you know, the seventh generation. So always thinking further ahead and the impact of what you do today in the future. So, I mean, to that, I, I, I understand uh, what is being said right now. Once again, we are somewhat privileged of this mandatory carriage, but we don't know how this is going to unfold in the near future. Everything is going online. So what's going to happen to traditional uh, linear television? Uh, but uh, that's a worrisome we have in, in Bill C-10. I'm sure we'll talk about it uh, soon during this conversation. Yeah. But otherwise, uh, yes, um, I think that all everything that's the user generated content. I mean, we, we fully support that and, and try to help, you know, as much as we can. I was hoping maybe we could actually move to that topic now, as you've already mentioned mandatory carriage. I mean, I think I recently read your comments uh, to the heritage community around the important role that the CRTC had played in terms of yeah. the, the discoverability of APTN, ensuring that it wasn't, I think the language that you sort of said is that people had to go through a lot of snow on the dial before they got to you. Uh, and I think that that might be an experience that um, each, uh, certainly maybe, I don't know if Aldo, you've had a similar experience, but I think that if you could talk a little bit about that, I mean, what and how do we begin to think about discoverability? And, you know, I would think about this in two, in two registers. Run, there's the practical. How do we make it sort of present for people as they move from linear to non-linear in, 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 many, in many venues? But I think more generally, even philosophically, discoverability probably means something slightly different, given what you've already talked about, the connection to 
producers, uh, the importance of, of ownership by members of, of the community, uh, and the connection to an audience that's often very different uh, in terms of how they will relate to the content that they're seeing on screen. So, I mean, I guess the first question, I mean, I'll, I'll maybe just start with you, Monica, because you I had heard sort of what you said, but I'm sort of interested to hear, one, how you're thinking and your concerns about discoverability in, in the emergent media context. And then second of all, sort of, uh, what kinds of ways we need to maybe think about discoverability in an expanded sense when we're beginning to think about uh, indigenous media and in the case of ethnocultural media, we're thinking about this. And I would also hear maybe call reference to um, some of the discussions around uh, metrics, audience metrics, and how we think about audience metrics as one of the tools of discoverability, right? That's how we verify that. Uh, so how do we have this conversation in a context where the very tools that we're using are tools that are built to sabotage in some ways precisely what we're trying to talk about? So, so many questions, Mark. <laughs> I'm going to try to answer all of them. It's like a, it's like a salad bar of questions. So you pick and choose, and you, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I'm just going to when I when I talked about APTN. So when APTN started more than 21 years ago, uh, mandatory carriage. Uh, often there was lots of snow before you got to our channel. Things have changed now on, uh, you know, every every platform. We, we could find APTN quite easily and we're pretty well located because there's so many television stations available now, right? Um, so uh, I think on the linear side, APTN finally, I think we have a dedicated space. I'm not saying that everybody knows us, but more and more people I talk to are aware of the existence of APTN and they know, oh yes, it's a, a television station with indigenous content and some people will just say, well, I don't watch it because, you know, I'm not indigenous, has nothing to do with me. Uh, there's always that barrier. But mm -hmm. nevertheless, I think we, we, we got to a point that, that we are rec recognizable. But now as everything is shifting online, that's a big challenge, not for all of us, but for many of us. Um, so as viewership is mig migrating, uh, it becomes a problem once again of discoverability and accessibility. So we're starting back to, you know, uh, what do you say this in English? La case de départ, at the beginning of the board yeah. game, right? Yeah. Uh, so, okay, how do we get that space now? So right now there's over like 55 OTT available in Canada. That's just going to increase substantially in the years to come. So right now with Bill C-10 as it stands, the CRTC would not have the power to oversee online content. Right now, the Broadcast Act is technologically neutral. So it means that the C CRTC wants to, could supervise online services. But with Bill C-10, it loses all of this power. Yeah. So what happened to the smaller broadcasters that we are migrating like everybody, we're going towards line because we're following the shift, we're following the trends. We want to be there knowing that the viewer now has the control and will decide to watch what they want, when they want or what platform they want. So we want to be there for them, but if they can't reach us. So if if there's no way for the CRTC to tell those, the, those BDUs, well, you're going to have to carry such and such, will just be available direct to consumer or not available at all because people can find us. So what's going to happen? And, and you know, it comes back to now you're, you talked about the ratings. I mean, the television industry is based mainly on ratings because that gets your advertising dollars. It helps to increase your CMF envelope, envelopes and whatnot. APTN's ratings are not representative of our core audience indigenous peoples so on the numerous sampling there's probably 0.001 percent that's indigenous mm -hmm. so on linear television we don't know but now on online with our ott platform we've got those that data now so now we could see and follow the audience so it's 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 going to help us but if we're not discoverable and not reachable What's the use to have that data, right? So I think what's important is for the CRTC to have this power, this authorization to overseas. How will that unfold? Well, I, I don't know just yet. I think that's another big conversation to have. 
not necessarily mirror what's in the broadcast I just said. I think we have to be able to adapt and accommodate, be flexible to see where things are developing. We don't know just yet the full impact or the economic impact of, of online distribution. But if, if, if they don't, if, if we can't include that oversight now, well, what's going to happen? Everything that we've gained, we're probably going to lose it. And, you know, us as Indigenous peoples, we know too well from history that if we don't have the support framework or policies in place, we'll probably disappear from the, lands from the, from the landscape as well. Um, so just to say that for us, for a question of survival, it's important for CRTC to have this oversight uh, to help us shoot, to be sure that we have this dedicated space. I think Did I answer some of your questions? There's yeah, so many of them. Answered, you answered all of them. You've, you've raised two or three that I want to ask for the next time we get to talk. Okay. So. I think the whole <laughs> issue of ratings is has been a, um, a you know a very difficult arena. This is the lexicon of agency world, and yes. to that end, I mean, we know that both public and private sector keep saying, "Well, who is ethnic media?" Who's out there? We don't know who's out there. And that's why the Canadian Ethnic Media Association is uh, putting, has um, refined and refurbished their ethnic media directory. And we have found more than 1,300 media, ethnic, ethnocultural media entities in Canada. I mean, that's impact. And I know there's studies that have been made um, out West and in other areas where uh, it's been shown that uh, media in other than English and French has more impact in the population um, than, than just English and French media. So I think the first step is to, uh, you know, to be able to recognize who is ethnic media and who's out there. And secondly, the whole area of um, you know, ratings is, is a difficult one because it's not consistent. You know, APTN wasn't rated for a very long time. You know, multilingual television isn't really rated. And we don't have, you know, we don't have the ammunition to, to be able to, you know, challenge agencies and advertisers. And this is what independent multilingual producers want and need to say, yes, I have impact in my community. There are people watching, but that's anecdotal right now, right. generally. I, I think digital media is kind of changing the game on that. And it is an agency conversation. When we talk about um, the, the rating of, of stations. Obviously, we already know it's a it's an age old understanding that language and and cultural content doesn't rate well <laughs> because it's not going to rate well. But we can't look at uh, we we have to start looking. We already hit the nail on the head. We have to start looking at it beyond um, the the scalability against the the larger audience. Um, media, our audiences aren't monolithic. Right. So we have to start looking at the strength of the market engagement and the strength of the impact of that of that media. And when you start looking at it from that lens, um, I think digital media does that really good at niching down into whatever the specific groups are. It's really the, the, the strength, the, the, the strength of attrition, the strength of um, your ability to um, build a community and share and share messaging with with that audience. And if you have um, strong, if you have a strong relationship with that audience, whatever the economic back end uh, you know back end result that you're looking for will come will come from that strength of that strength of impact um, and I think that's the message that has to change I think from a broadcast standpoint um, the way that we view audiences has to be a, a, a lot more um, niche specific and a lot less um, uh, scale specific in terms of like, doing everything off of the macro we need to go we need to move to the micro and it might be a little bit more difficult in terms of restructuring and rejigging the way that agencies work and the way that they communicate but that's the that's the future step that needs to that needs to take place in terms of how we um uh really articulate media across across the country what we're getting at is that it's not it's not a monolithic conversation if 90 percent of media is owned by four players and you know they're speaking one language. Obviously, media is being consumed at much higher rates at a niche level beyond what those player what those players are providing. And ratings doesn't doesn't capture that. Yeah, and I really like your point about impact because you could be 
you could be speaking to a smaller community, but you know, you an ethnic cultural community, but you could be the only ethnic media entity speaking to that community. And how exactly. do you measure that impact? So I, I really like to uh, put impact in bold letters in this, this yes. discussion. And maybe it's time to move away from traditional assessment of audiences. And digital certainly is going to allow us to do that. Yeah. Uh, just just to, for that, that word impact, you're so right. Like we, we just greenlight a, a production uh, and it's gonna be uh, done in indigenous languages that about a hundred people speak only. And like people are like, yes. why are you doing that? Because that hundred people, it's damn important to us. And yes. you need to service us. You need to show that it's important. So yes, fair enough. I mean, you know, uh, mainstream wants to get the ratings and the big bucks, but there's more to that. I mean, yeah. we're communicating. This is our job. I mean, APTN, we're trying to service a population that's underrepresented. A lot of people Monica, don't care about. So what we're trying to do is bring that to the forefront, bring those stories, bring those diverse perspectives and being sure those communities have the information they deserve to have. But that, that production that you have to the, to the hundred people to speak that language, mm -hmm. this is a true Canadian historical record. As you yes. take a look at your point going down seven generations forward, this is history that has to be documented and, you know, and history is, of course, you know, important for the present and the future, of course. So exactly. And if that production was subtitled in English and French, I think a lot of people would be interested in watching it. Right. Um, right. Which, you know, speaks to a model that was adopted in our sister Commonwealth country, Australia. Mm -hmm. The special broadcasting service decades ago was established as a government-owned multicultural service. It's blossomed over the decades. Um, it does an incredible job of not only servicing multilingual communities in Australia, which really mirrors our, our society, um, but also providing bridge programming essentially providing a, v, a, a window on all those multicultural communities through the biggest subtitling operation in the world. Right. They subtitle all their third language, in their case, foreign language. They don't have, it's a second language. They, their, their first language is English. Mm -hmm. um, they subtitle it all in English. So people are w able to watch movies from around the world in different languages. Um, um, and it, language is not a barrier to the mainstream. That's important to building social capital. That's Im important to building the social infrastructure that Mark talked about at the beginning. There's a lot been written about this. Um, and I'm sure Mark's familiar with the uh, Bob Putnam's book, so the uh, uh, Bowling Alone. Um, and I just listened to a podcast about that, that whole concept. It all emanated from uh, an exploration by these public policy experts about why uh, northern uh, Italian um, regions were more efficient, more productive, more wealthy than southern Italian regions. And it boiled down to um, um, trust and understanding among, uh, in their case, they were all Italians. Uh, in the case of Canada and in America, uh, the more multicultural we are, the harder we have to work at building trust and understanding across cultures, because that's the only way that society ends up being more efficient, uh, more resourceful, more productive, and more wealthy. So these are fundamental issues. I just wanted to say that Monica superbly summarized the position of the Independent Broadcasters Group with respect to Bill C-10, which is if you don't empower the CRTC to deal with online services, because our traditional platforms are all moving to online services. So, so within a couple of years, everybody's gonna be governed under the online services regime. If you don't empower the CRTC to um, um, implement the objectives you set, um, this is an existential threat to all remaining independent broadcasters in Canada 
Yes. Um, APTN included because their designation as essential isn't necessarily forever. So the, we call them 91H services. There's only a handful that are 91H, but that won't necessarily last forever. And if they're like, if they become like every other independent broadcaster, well, in 2015, the CRTC in its wisdom decided to remove all entitlement, no individual channel in Canada other than a 91H is entitled to be discovered, is entitled to be carried on the shelf of our traditional broadcasters. That's a fundamental shift. Um, no individual channel, like that is huge. So when you talk about discoverability, you can't be discovered if you're not offered. Where you're offered and how you're offered is critical. But if you you can't, if you're not even entitled to be offered, um, we've essentially handed the keys to the gatekeepers, the biggest corporations, um, to decide who gets carried and who doesn't, and nobody's entitled to be carried. That's a problem. Hmm. Um, and when you talk about measurement, yes, but uh, the traditional measurement system in Canada, Numeris, uh, people will recognize AC Nielsen ratings, but Numeris is the... Uh, successor to AC Nielsen, uh, they don't recruit their sample in Canada based on ethnicity or language. They have said so. Um, so when they estimate audiences based on this small sample that's not representative, um, they have a huge margin of error. There is a way to measure audiences though, and that is set-top box data. That is set-top box data. And there again, the CRTC, uh, has failed to implement the promises of 2015, which is that independents who have trouble accessing set-top box data, because set-top box data are the digital boxes that all of the traditional carriers now deliver their services on. They are just like the internet. You can count every single box and who's tuned in for how long. That data um, is not being shared with independent broadcasters and it's taken now six years. It won't be till 2022 before apparently that data will potentially be shared. In the meantime, that data is being used by those who have it, which is the five or six large organizations that not only have mobile services and deliver your uh, internet service and uh, also have media channels and also are the platforms that carry those media channels, that's being used by them. Yeah. Um, but not being shared but with independence. So it's a real problem because uh, I think independents have been so squeezed into the corner of the system that they're now considered irrelevant to the success of the system. So these challenges are existential because there is value to independent broadcasting. Independent broadcasting is what gives our system diversity. Diversity is not multicultural Canadians working as employees for establishment owned companies and appearing on establishment owned platforms. Right. That is an element of diversity, mm -hmm. but that doesn't deliver diversity, full diversity. We I know think, that. I yeah. think this is where local is queen. And I, I think you know, certainly in this time of COVID, what we've learned is that you know, local, you know, your community, your you know, local geographic um, area is, is very important. <laughs> And furthermore, I think it's so important, especially at this time where we know uh, that racism is on the rise in North America because of this COVID pandemic and other you know, reasons, that it is so important to be able to have community expression and cross-cultural expression. I think we talked about that earlier, having you know, small communities uh, speak in language to their audiences, but also share that information because we are in a precarious time right now for both community reflection, ethnocultural reflection and democracy, if you will. And so I think uh, the role of uh, third language, uh, the three, the four pillars of, of media presently is to mitigate this phenomena of the rise of racism as well. And we all know, we've talked about this earlier that language is culture. And frankly, this contributes to self-esteem of a community and the health of a community. And I think this is where um, this, the Broadcast Act 
and uh, you know, further legislation and policy has to enshrine a place for ethnocultural communities, for indigenous communities to finally have a rightful and equitable place in this broadcasting system. I'm gonna turn, there's actually, we have had one question in the chat and I'm gonna just turn to that question right now because I'm cognizant of the time and I think we're gonna be coming to an end quite soon. Um, uh, so uh, the question is, uh, what are some of the tangible things? And I know that there's a number of producers who've joined us today. So what are the tangible things that we in the independent producing community can do to help pro propel this change and demand parity in the broadcast? Communicate to you know the Heritage Committee, to uh, some of us are doing that already, to members of uh, Parliament. I think that that's probably the key thing. Um, uh, Monica, do you want to, did you want to add anything or no? No, no, that that's what needs to be done. I mean, you have to go straight to those people and write letters and, you know, ask for meetings if possible to get that message out there. I mean, it, strength comes with numbers, right? So the more you are pleading and asking for the same thing, well, at least, you know, you'll have more of an ear. So it's to show that, you know, it's not just us asking for it. It's, it's bigger, right? There's a whole population that's demanding this. We don't have an army of lawyers and lobbyists in Ottawa on a full-time basis advocating for our interests or the interests of our communities. And we're um, working against an army of lawyers and lobbyists funded by establishment interests um, pursuing their interests. And as an investor, because I own shares in my RSP and each one of these companies that we're um, mentioning as controlling 90% of our broadcast system. Well, as an investor, I'm happy, but because they're doing well, they're making money, they're paying dividends, their share price is going up. Mm -hmm. um, but as an industry participant and as a Canadian, I think we have to, pay attention to the introduction that you gave us, Mark, because you are the guru of multicultural Canadian media. You know more about it than all of us. Um, and it's an important issue. It's um, Take the compliment. <laughs> I, I think the pitfall of independent media is the, the challenge that a lot of us feel like we have to do it alone. Um, and it, and one of the one of the key phrases that I've brought up over the years of my work working in community is community led media. The fact that even though you're an ind independent curator, there is a large community of us. And just like the small business, um, the small business um, uh, cohort across the country, they're a larger demographic than the bigger than the bigger um, entities. Right, eighty percent of business in Canada are small businesses. So just like independent media, I think um, if you're an independent curator of content and you're producing really quality work, um, one, communicate to your MPs that you're doing that, that you exist in that writing or in, in that community and work alongside those existing um, platforms like the APTNs, the NCRAs, the TLNs of the world to just let your, see if there's room or opportunity for collaboration of sorts. But speaking up um, as a collective whole is the is the first start to letting the parliament know that our voice together is stronger than the the the, the language that independent um, dictates it to be. Um, I think we can post this event, post uh, both the things that we're doing collectively. I think the CEC and us and IBG and uh, CEMA uh, in terms of our advocating for changes to Bill C10. Um, and also the information on how you can actually, anybody, any Canadian can uh, intervene in the Canadian, the, 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 the Heritage Committee right now, uh, the Parliamentary Committee uh, for Heritage is studying Bill C-10. It's past second reading, it's studying it. And there's a big push to push this legislation through. And a lot of what's being said is it may not be perfect, but at least it does one thing right, which is to try to get uh, some foreign players to contribute to the system. Um, but that's not enough. Not when you re revise your your broadcasting act once every 30 years. Uh, you probably better deal with the systemic inequities that you say you're going to deal with. Um, right. And that's what we're saying. So that's, that's, you know, on a 
just to answer the the the, the question, um, how can you what can you do uh, to push these initiatives forward? A, we'll share the initiatives with you in writing. Secondly, you can directly write and make submissions to, as a Canadian, to the Heritage Committee about Bill C-10. Um, and thirdly, this is the legislative process. We're not talking about the regulatory process that comes afterwards and that has been going on for years and years because each time the regulatory process is happening with respect to any particular issue, you can intervene. I think the regulators have been uh, deaf to the voices that we're representing. Uh, that's my opinion. That's the opinion of, a lot of others over the last decades, which is why we find ourselves where we are. Um, but this is the legislative process, which is the important first step. And as Monica has said, the legislation has to, number one, create clear goals, um, create the right objectives, and then secondly, it has to empower the regulator to implement those objectives. So it must not strip the CRTC of the power to implement those objectives uh, when it comes to online services. Um, anyway. Hmm. Um, I'm Collective looking, activism. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think uh, I, I'm looking at the uh, at the time and I'm cognizant of, of, of needing to wrap up. I mean, I think um, I'm going to I'm going to give the participants the last word, but I think there's a couple things that come to mind over the course of our discussion today. First of all, um, I think it's clear that the stakes are bigger, perhaps, than we may initially think. And I think that here we were seeing the way that what's being put in place now will be there for a long time, will have impacts and ramifications for decades to come, is about more than just how we regulate a handful of foreign players to come into the Canadian market, but really about how we think about democracy, society, community, and how we engage with these concepts. And I think that what's at stake here isn't just whether or not one is in favor or not of community. I think that that's sort of a really sort of simple and underplays what's really at stake here, but really the extent to which we're willing to allow a broadcast and media system really to support different kinds of dislocation and the failure of communication, right? Uh, in which we don't necessarily hear our voices in the media that we consume, but really are put into positions where we're disempowered as opposed to empowered. And I think that this comes back to where we just were talking about it, but the importance that this is the legislative phase, but that this is a democratic process and needs to be remain to be understood as one. Uh, and that, that, that we should all sort of engage with it directly. But I'm gonna give the last word to each of you if you wanna add anything in our, in our final five minutes. I recognize that there, there are a handful of questions in, in the chat and I apologize that we may not be able to get to them. Um, there's, there's a question about the future being streaming uh, and so mandatory carriage uh, becoming an obsolete concept as we move and migrate into uh, the digital context. Um, and then a handful of questions here about really what the balance can be between um, uh, grassroots media uh, and uh, larger mainstream and uh, media providers. Uh, so I think in that sense, you know, I don't know if you want to weave some of these ideas or, or, or concepts into how you might want to close off the discussion, but also just free, feel free to raise any other points that you'd like to raise. Uh, and then we'll sort of, uh, uh, you know, before I do that, though, I did want to thank each of you for participating, uh, for making time coming today. And I also want to thank all of our, our, our audience members who've, who've, who've sat in uh, and some of whom have contributed questions. Um, so on that note, I'm actually going to do it in reverse order this time, rather than starting with Aldo. Yay. Um, <laughs> As I said, it's, yeah. that's refreshing, yes. Yeah. yeah, so we'll start. Madeline, would you like to? Yeah. So, and I think changes are so infrequent uh, with policy in view of, uh, you know, the Broadcast Act, ethnic policy review, et cetera that really, it, it, this is an opportunity, as you said, to really ensconce and enshrine what's important to Canadian democracy and Canadian reflection. So, uh, you know, what's the big rush to, you know, push this bill through? We, we know some of the answers to that, but I think certainly it's, it's a time to take a pause and really, and really capture what's important today, um, where we're dealing with an environment of, you know, a pandemic, where we know local is important, and also where we know that democracy could be at risk and racism is on the rise. 
And it's important to you know, really capture important Canadian values in this act. And lastly, to um, supply some kind of structural change that will emancipate independent language producers to you know, have funding in, in a meaningful and equitable fashion. Thank you. Um, actually, maybe I'm going to shake it up. I'm going to let Aldo go now so that Aldo doesn't get the last word also. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, Aldo, do you want to go? Yeah. Yeah, I think now's the time to address systemic inequities. Um, the changes we're proposing are not um, crazy by any, by any means. Um, in fact, the people that we've been talking to over the past um, month and a half um, since the beginning of the year. This legislation was tabled in November, as everybody knows. Um, everybody is receptive to these ideas. Um, um, the only issue is that, as Madeline says, there's a rush to push through uh, legislation that's admittedly non-comprehensive. Um, and that is skipping over important issues simply to deal with one important issue. Um, and in doing so, creating some unintended consequences that Monica has pointed out regarding um, even the ability of the CRTC to try to implement these objectives. There's a, there's a whole other seminar we can have, a whole other conference on uh, whether the CRTC is effective, whether it needs to be reformed, whether the, in fact it is um, currently stacked with too many, um, establishment industry friendly players, um, whether it itself is the victim rather than the perpetrator of the systemic inequities we're talking about, because there is this concept known as regulatory capture where they are so enveloped with the narratives that are being peddled by the dominant players um, that they think they're doing the right thing and that they think they're acting in the public interest, but they're not. Um, because our voices are not being heard, and so there is no contrary story. So in that context, I think it's important for us to keep pushing to uh, be able to recognize in this legislation our stories, our languages, and our channels as Canada's ethnic minorities. It's a pretty simple proposition. Um, that's about it. Um, Monica. Well, I'm just going to go because, uh, you know, I totally support what Madeline and, and Aldo just said, but I'm just going to go to a question that was in the chat and they talked about grassroots media initiatives and their overall impact on, you know, the mainstream or bigger players. And, you know, it comes from the grassroots. Everything comes from grassroots and you need to support and, you know, the role that those grassroots media plays in those different communities is essential. Um, it shows that value is given to that community, to those languages, to those cultures, to the traditions, to those storytelling. And then it goes up, right? Um, you know, I'm very proud that uh, APTN, we work with a lot of grassroots independent producers and we gave a lot of, of chances. I mean, for, first chances to a lot of uh, indigenous producers and storytellers that never would have had the opportunity. And, you know, we're a risk taker. And I think all of us here at the table, we are risk takers. And I think that we are successful in what we do. And I think our communities realize that and we have the support from those communities. And if, it, you know, and, and we need to continue to be able to take those risks because others will not, they won't, because they don't know how. Um, they are too disconnected to the realities. I'm talking about, you know, grassroots, everything that we do, it comes from us, comes from within. So I need we to continue and we're building the strength together. Um, and like Aldo said, you know, being part of the in, um, independent broadcast group is a strength on itself. And every time we have our meetings, we speak for one another because we all have the same concerns. We have the same battles, but we are very proud of, of what we've done so far. And we just know what else we could do. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Uh, and Randy? Um, yeah, real simply, I mean, everybody said it great. And I think this conversation is important because it's really about 
it's it's not just about the act and how um, legislation is cure, is um, you know brought together here in this country because I think there's obviously opportunities to miss a lot of things and we kind of highlighted that already that the the fear the I guess the apprehension in the establishment of acts like this is the fact that um, are we are we truly creating opportunities to onboard equitable experiences of you know those that are represented across the country and um, are diverse curators being recognized um, future forward um, in terms of how um, stories are being consumed and, dist and distributed across the country. So the, the, the conversation is important. Um, you know, we've been, we've been sort of parachuting, parachuting or free falling without a shoot in a lot of ways and observing the landscape on our, on our way down and doing that successfully in a lot of different ways. But um, what we're looking for is uh, some collaboration and understanding that there is a, a, a huge component of the population uh, across Canada that uh, wants to be integrated, trying to find ways to be integrated into the conversation. And there isn't a catch all onboarding for them. And you can see it with the struggles in the language that's being used in the documents, you know, whether it, they use diversity or they use equity, they use BIPOC, they use whatever. It's them saying that we don't understand how to encapsulate um, that huge diversity, but it's overtaking us, right? It, it, is the, it is the majority. And I think that's where we probably have to slow down um, some of the conversations to uh, ensure like, are there, is there true representation and understanding of that equity across the country? And, um, and that's where it really comes from. The opportunities that, BC, that Bill C-10 provides um, could be um, long-term phenomenal, could be short-term, mid-term phenomenal. Um, but the, the larger question is, how does it support the, you know, the, the, true, the true diverse fabric of uh, cultures and communities across Canada? And I think that's where these communities continue, need to continue uh, to take place. And those that are on this call and those that represent the various communities, um, there's, there's room to uh, collaborate and further, and further communicate those, um, th those, those, those realities. Um, but thank you for the time, Mark, and for letting us um, have this conversation for sure. No, thank you. Thank you all. And I'll just remind all of the um, attendees that uh, we did record the conversation today. So we will have a recording of this available should you want to come back uh, and revisit or to share it with others. Uh, yeah, and all the people. So can, 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 we much much show, can we do a talk show? Can we do a talk show plug for your book, Mark? <laughs> since you're not going to do it, you're too modest. Yeah. Everybody should buy this book. It is a, the definitive. Uh, chronicling of uh, multicultural media in Canada um, post World War II, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you, Aldo. And thanks to everyone. I hope everyone has a great rest of the day. And I hope that this conversation continues uh, either with the people here or with amongst yourselves and with others. Because as we, it's always says, the future could be bright, but you got to fight for it. <laughs>